Hello and welcome to the world of NDE 4.0. My name is Johannes Frana and today is a great day because today we will be speaking about the idea behind the digital twin. Now in the next weeks we will also be getting into the details of the digital twin and the digital threat and perhaps also how to implement it. Um, but actually I think for the moment it's really important that you get a basic understanding to get the idea behind the digital twin. So let's get started. Now, digital twin, digital twin can also be the digital twin of a person like myself. And if I think about what could be the digital twin of myself or actually the, the data behind the digital twin of myself, then it's quite easy. It's all my connections. It's my friends. It's my professional connections my financial data, both on the private side and on the business side. It's my medical records. It's my operational data. It's material data, volumetric uh, composition. And it's some dimensional information like size, weight, and perhaps also the age, production date, so to say. And if you think about, think about the internet and all those yeah, social platforms, you will see that they already have a lot of information about you. And if you think one step further, if you think into your yeah, IRS, your tax information systems, if you think about your health insurance, if you think about government, they all have a lot of data of you. Now, what needs to be done to actually use that data is we need a semantic interoperability. And I have done a video on this topic a couple of weeks ago, and you will find the link here. And, but to give you a, what semantic interoperability does is actually, it gives the computer the ability to actually do an interpretation of the data. It makes it machine readable machine understandable. So once we get to that point of having all of that information in a machine readable state, then actually we can do analysis on it. We can use AI, we can use statistics, we can use whatever of algorithms we can think of, and then we can actually predict the behavior. We can, for example, predict my purchase behavior. We can predict my health status. We can even predict perhaps my life prediction. And you can already see that the, the value of that information is quite an extensive value to a lot of different bodies. And similarly, it's true if we think about industry. Once we collect all of that data we are getting during production, we're getting during operation, uh, by installing additional sensors, by taking data from ERP, MES, uh, PLM, and whatever systems, combining all of that, processing it, combining it with NDE data, processing it further, and finally we get an additional value because we can predict behavior. Now, but if we think about back going to the personal side and all of the that exp, all of what we can do with all of the data there is actually a tv series which shows in an excellent way that both the benefits of something like that and also the issues the challenges and that series is westworld and within the third season they are actually getting really into the topic of a digital twin they collect all of the data from all of the persons so that they can actually simulate every single person. And this here, what you see in the background here, that's actually the computer having all of the data from everybody and being able to do the prediction on everybody. Now, it has good points because actually you can really perhaps see if 
is somebody really fit for a job. But you can turn it also around and yeah, I guess you get the idea. So therefore we have to make kind of our data secure. And how do we make our data secure? Now, if we talk about data security, data security has two sides to it. There is number one, if you have your data stored on your computer or on some database system, and you actually, um, and actually somebody gets onto your computer and deletes all of your data, or you have a hard drive crash, then all of your data is lost. To prevent that from happening, we are actually doing backups. There's a second part to data security, and that's if I send my data from myself to somebody else, and they don't know, want somebody third to steal it in between, or I have it stored on my computer and don't want somebody else to steal it, yeah, then actually we use data encryption. And we will get in a future video into this subject. I guess it will even be the next video. Now, but there is another case. Let's say I give my data using a secure line to somebody else. He stores it on his computer. What tells me that this person will not give the data to a third person? Nothing. There's no legal requirement. There's no technical thing preventing it, at least currently. Because if we talk about all the data we have on the technical side, there is actually no copyright on that data. There needs to be a legal agreement between me and the receiving partner, a one-to-one -one legal agreement detailing that the second person is not allowed to give it to somebody else. If you don't do that, the second person doesn't have any problem with doing it. Now, I'm not a lawyer. This is just information I got from a conversation with the IDS8 and International Data Spaces Association. But if you have any question to that subject, please ask it and I will try to get somebody who has a better legal view on those topics. But getting back to the subject. Now, number one, we need those contracts between A and B so that B doesn't give it to C but we also need a technical solution. And the technical solution for it is data sovereignty. Now, excuse me if I pronounce that word incorrectly. Um, that's where my English is getting to be a little bit weak. But I think it's called data sovereignty. Now, what data sovereignty means that we have, that A has a computer system, B has a computer system, we transfer the data using a secure line, and we not only transfer the data, we actually also transfer rules. Rules, what system number two is allowed to do with the data. And if the rules say that system number two is not, or the user on system number two is not allowed to dry, store it on a USB stick, or to transfer it to person C, then actually the system installed at user number two will prevent him from doing it. And how do we make sure that this is done in that way? By certifying all those systems and by actually providing something called IDS connectors. Now, for sure there will be other solution than the one from IDSA, but that's the one I know best up to the moment. So, thanks for watching this video. Thanks a lot. I hope you like this video. Um, I hope you like this basic introduction into the digital twin. Um, I hope you like this short expedition into data sovereignty, data security, and we will be speaking more, more in detail about those topics because for me, they are so important. The next thing I want to do is speaking about data security. 
If you have any comments, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them down here into the comments. As usual, you will find more information in the description. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe to this channel. I hope I will see you soon. So thanks again for watching. See you soon. Thank you and bye.